Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to talk about a couple adrenal pathologies, both of which relate to levels of cortisol, and those are Addison's disease and Cushing's disease. But before we get into that, let's do a brief review of what the adrenal glands actually do. So right here we have one of the kidneys, and then you can see on top of it you've got this adrenal gland. I kind of think of it like the hat of the kidney. It looks like a hat. Now the adrenal gland has two major components. There's the adrenal medulla or medulla, which is in the dead center, and then this is surrounded by the adrenal cortex. Now the adrenal medulla is responsible for the synthesis of catecholamines, and it's under the control of the sympathetic nerve. So a big part of the fight or flight response during acute stress is the sympathetic nerve activates and triggers the adrenal medulla to release catecholamines into the blood, the major one being epinephrine. And then this epinephrine does things like allow your eyes to dilate, you have a heart rate increase, stroke volume increase, basically things you need to handle that acute stress. And then outside of the medulla, we have the cortex. And the adrenal cortex has three sub-layers. In the outer one in blue here is called the zona glomerulosa. This one is mainly responsible for synthesizing the hormone aldosterone. The middle one in red here is the zona fasciculata. This one is responsible for the synthesis of cortisol. And then the purple one here, the deepest of the cortex, is the zona reticulata. And this is responsible for the synthesis of androgens like DHEA and there's another one called androstenedione. dione. Now these three hormones, aldosterone, cortisol, and then any of the androgens here made by the zona reticulata, these are all steroid hormones. And steroid hormones ultimately come from cholesterol. This is the parent steroid. And then this cholesterol can be processed through this biosynthetic pathway to make cortisol and aldosterone. Now is it important to know all of this? Probably not. But the main reason I put this here to show you is that for one of the signs and symptoms later on, it may be important to rationalize that the pathway to make cortisol is very similar to the pathway to make aldosterone. You can see a bunch of these enzymes and actually some others upstream here are actually shared between the two. And so sometimes when you have an insufficiency of cortisol, you might also have an insufficiency of aldosterone. And the same thing goes for a hypersecretion of cortisol. There may actually be a hypersecretion of aldosterone. So let's get into it. So the two adrenal pathologies have to do with either an insufficiency or an excess of the hormone cortisol. So we're mainly thinking about that zona fasciculata. Now, the first one is called Addison's disease. Addison's disease is the insufficiency. We'll see in a few minutes that the excess is called Cushing's syndrome or Cushing's disease. The way I remember that Addison's disease is the insufficiency is I think if something's insufficient, it's more absent, right? Absent A, Addison's A. So that's the way I remember that this one is the insufficiency. So Addison's disease specifically is a hyposecretion by the adrenal gland, really the adrenal cortex, not the medulla due to an autoimmune disease or a tumor. And so there's a lot of things within the cortex that can be hyposecreted, but the major thing we're concerned with is that cortisol. So what are the signs and symptoms of Addison's disease? Well, the first is gonna be dark pigmentation of the skin. You can see that over here, this is actually a Caucasian or a white woman with Addison's disease. And the skin here is actually a lot darker than we might expect. That's due to that dark pigmentation, which is caused by insufficiency of these hormones, mainly cortisol. There's also hypotension. When we think of cortisol, this is the chronic stress hormone. Epinephrine is really the acute stress, but if we're exposed to stress for a long period of time, cortisol is really that stress hormone that gets released. And so if we're thinking of stress, we're thinking of higher heart rate, higher blood pressure, right? So if we have an insufficiency of cortisol, we're gonna have a lower blood pressure, so hypotension. Okay? There might also be progressive fatigue, and the main reason for this is because one of the functions of cortisol normally is to actually uh, spare blood glucose for the brain. But if there is low cortisol, then we're not really sparing as much glucose or energy for the brain, and so the person may experience fatigue. That can actually get worse and worse as this gets prolonged more and more. We also have this hyperkalemia. This is an excessively high potassium level in the blood. And why might that be? Well, remember I said down here 
that these two pathways for the synthesis of cortisol and aldosterone are quite similar, right? They share a lot of the same enzymes, and so if we have a deficiency of something in this pathway, and that leads to a deficiency of cortisol, we'll probably also have a deficiency of aldosterone, and that's what we see. And so what does aldosterone normally do? Well, it triggers the secretion and therefore excretion of excess potassium. And so it actually acts to lower blood potassium. But if we have a deficiency of aldosterone, we're not gonna be able to do that as much. And so instead of removing potassium from the blood, potassium can actually build up in the blood. And so that's why we see this hyperkalemia in Addison's disease. There may also be GI disturbances, joint pain, muscle pain, Sometimes tendons can calcify if this goes on for a long period of time, and also hypoglycemia. Remember we mentioned cortisol's normal function is to actually raise blood glucose, in part for sparing it for vital organs like the brain. Well, if there's not enough cortisol, then the blood glucose is going to be expected to be lower, therefore hypoglycemia. Now, can a physical therapist treat the joint pain and muscle pain? Yes. Uh, can a dietitian get involved and help with this fatigue and hypoglycemia? Yeah, probably. But there is nothing that any of these professions can do to directly target the actual problem, which is a hyposecretion of cortisol. And so therefore, an MD is going to have to get involved uh, for this treatment, and that's really just cortisol or, in general, hormone replacement. Okay? Um, they have low cortisol for whatever reason. Therefore, they're going to have to supplement cortisol. And you obviously can't get that from a dietitian, a PT clinic, an OT clinic. You can't do any of those things, right? That has to come specifically from an MD or DL. Okay? So that's the treatment for this, is cortisol replacement. That's Addison's disease. That's the insufficiency. The case where there's excess is Cushing's disease. Okay? Cushing's disease. The C in this, I think, of cortisol. we got lots and lots of cortisol, so we have lots and lots of C, so... Cushing's disease, or sometimes called Cushing's syndrome. And as you can expect, it's a hypersecretion of cortisol by the adrenal cortex due to a tumor, excessive corticosteroids, or pituitary dysfunction. Now, in terms of the pituitary, remember the anterior pituitary, or the adenohypophysis, as it's called, releases a hormone called ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. That ACTH is then going to go to the zona fasciculata, and it's going to trigger it to start making cortisol. Well, if we have a pituitary issue uh, or dysfunction where there's excessive release of ACTH, then we're also going to have excessive release of cortisol, and that causes that hypersecretion. That can actually be due to a pituitary tumor that's causing the excessive release of ACTH. The excessive corticosteroids, that's just taking excessive corticosteroids. So some conditions require use of them from time to time, but if you're using corticosteroids excessively, then you can create an artificial Cushing's disease. It's not caused by a tumor, it's not caused something with the pituitary gland, it's literally just caused because you're taking too much of the drug. And so the obvious solution to excessive corticosteroids is just stop taking them. And then all of these things that we'll talk about in just a second should subside a little bit. Okay. But generally speaking, it's going to be either due to a pituitary dysfunction of the anterior pituitary or a tumor within the adrenal cortex itself. So what are the signs and symptoms of Cushing's disease? Well, you can actually see a person who presents with that right here, but let's go through these individual signs and symptoms. The first is weight gain. It is no secret that you're going to have trouble losing weight when you are very, very stressed all the time. Normally, people who have chronic stress are going to have issues losing weight and probably no issues gaining weight. And that actually has to do with the cortisol release due to the chronic stress. But that's just due to stress, right? Uh, these individuals uh, may not be able to help it as much. They have just, for whatever reason, a tumor or a pituitary problem, excessive cortisol in their blood. That's going to predispose them to weight gain. They also can end up with these fatty deposits. Uh, you can actually see a few of them here. Uh, they can be in the midsection, so in the abdomen. It can also be in the face. You can see some fatty deposits here um, that cause this moon-shaped appearance in the face. And also between the shoulders and the upper back, you can actually see one right here. That's called a buffalo hump in the case of Cushing's disease. And those fatty deposits only are going to be present in somebody with Cushing's disease. Okay? So if you see those things, that may be an indication this is what you're dealing with. 
Now, in addition to sparing glucose for the brain and doing things like raising blood pressure a little bit for dealing with stress, cortisol also has some very negative functions uh, in terms of healing. So one of the things that cortisol normally does is it actually uh, reduces the degree of protein synthesis. Because theoretically, when you're in an acutely or chronically stressed state, that's not what your body needs to be doing. It doesn't need to be synthesizing proteins, right? It should actually be breaking down proteins uh, breaking them down to amino acids so you can have energy, right? Getting energy to deal with the stress. So when you have excessive cortisol and Cushing's disease, that's going to impair protein synthesis. And so anything that requires more protein synthesis is also going to be impaired. Skin is going to thin. Why is it going to thin? Because protein synthesis is being outweighed by protein degradation. And that also causes bruises to form more easily because there's less uh, cutaneous tissue. Uh, and so it's thinner, it bruises more easily. Okay? Uh, skin injuries, slower to heal. So if you cut yourself or there's any kind of a decubitus, anything that causes a skin injury, uh, those are going to be slower to heal. Muscle weakness. Uh, muscles are going to be impaired because muscles atrophy in the presence of high levels of cortisol. Uh, this is actually why they say if you're actually trying to build muscle, you're trying to hypertrophy it in the gym, you need adequate sleep. Adequate sleep reduces stress and allows time for your muscles to heal. But with excessive cortisol, uh, your muscles are not healing. They're getting damaged by everyday activities, and they're not healing as much because protein synthesis is outweighed by its degradation. So you end up with muscle weakness, and then of course you can also end up with fatigue, as you might imagine, with Cushing's disease. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of Addison's disease versus Cushing's disease. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.